the idyllic villages that cling to our coastline. <laughs> Known for their beauty and serenity. Wow, look at this, just incredible. Now destinations for our leisure. This is like exploring a jungle. But once they played a vital role in our history. That's got to be the lost village. I'm Ben Robinson, and as an archaeologist, I'm fascinated by coastal villages. I want to explore them, discover their histories, and unearth often surprising pasts. I've come to Cushendall, which is on the northeast coast of Northern Ireland, and nestled in one of the nine glens of Antrim, an area of outstanding natural beauty. In the 1800s, Cushendall's visionary eccentric owner had grand plans to turn his village into the centre of a new global order. He's been working on this scheme for many years, which he calls the Integral Union of Human Society. And he sees Cushendall in some ways as a means to test out these ideas. And I'll discover how he kept the villagers in check. One of the main defences of the building would have been a murder hole. He would politely tell him to leave, and if that didn't work, he would reach down and goes, please go back home again. <laughs> There's a fascinating story to this village by the sea. Cushendall has the sea on one side and the heights of the Antrim Plateau on the other. You can see Lurig there, the mountain, in the distance. It's a dramatic landscape. It's a treacherous coast. This meant that settlers here were isolated from the rest of this northern part of Ireland right up until the 1800s. It was a problem many had tried to solve. It would take one visionary Northern Irishman to truly succeed, bringing his big ideals to this small place. Cushendall takes its name from the River Dawl, which winds its way through the centre and out to sea. I'm looking for the earliest buildings to discover the origins of this village. Just walking down this very, very steep hill into the centre of the village and a mix of architecture. There are some early buildings here, but mainly 19th century in date, early 19th century Georgian, except for this. This is something a little bit different. It looks like some sort of tower keeping watch over the village. Just looking at some of the architecture down here, again, there's a lot of Georgian architecture. There's some later stuff as well, some Victorian, but mostly it's early 19th century. And something really distinctive is the colours as well. Absolutely beautiful. Even though the buildings are all a slightly different date, this gives it a sort of uniformity and a very pleasant look as well. This is said to be one of the finest Georgian streets of any Irish village. Oh, this is the parish church here. It doesn't look at all medieval. There's no medieval fabric there at all. It's Gothic architecture, those lancet windows there with their hood moulds, pointy arches there. And we're talking the early years of the 19th century. You see the bell coat there, those little pinnacles. I don't think there was a medieval church here at all in the village. And that says to me that there wasn't a medieval village here either. The village we see today only began to take shape from the late 1700s. Although there were settlers here before this, the landscape dictated where they could live. 
Professor Chris Jackson has studied the geology of the area. Chris, just travelling around the area, it strikes me how geologically diverse it is. Yeah, ice sheets carved this landscape a few tens of thousands of years ago. And it's that which gave rise to the glens of Antrim, so the valleys that we're standing at the mouth of here, they are the direct product of these glaciers. And the thing that sort of looms over here is that, the mountain, very quickly, the land rises up quite significantly. This is a very much a volcanic landscape. Hard rocks form uplands, but those uplands and the tops of the mountains we're seeing here, they're formed from uh, basalt, but it's really, really resistant. It's really tough. They don't break down to form such a rich soil, meaning it's really, really hard to farm up there. But the rocks we're standing on right here now in this low area, they're quite soft. They erode quite easily. They're actually quite easy to break down into soil, meaning they can be farmed quite readily. Is it true to say that this provides the foundation for human settlement here? You, you've kind of got to work with the landscape that you've got. Exactly. The geology directly dictates how people work the land and what resources they have available to them. Oh, you've got a map. I love a good map. Yeah, so this is telling us about the rocks we're standing on. But the high mountainous landscapes behind us are these pink rocks in through here. See that they're forming most of this map. And as an archaeologist, I can immediately see why all the settlements are along the coast here. You wouldn't want to be farming on that high, unfertile <laughs> pink stuff. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> The challenging landscape here meant that people lived spread out in order to forage and grow enough food to survive. Not many clues exist about life before the village, but less than a mile from Cushendal is the ancient Laid Church. It was one of only a few communal buildings in the area and brought scattered locals together to worship. Hector MacDonald's family owned land here from the 1300s. Hector, this is a wonderful spot, absolutely beautiful, but quite secluded. Why a church here? Yes, well, this is a very, very early Christian site. There were no towns here, there were no villages, nothing. There was what's called a clachan, which is just a collection of, of small huts, and they were dotted about the countryside. So a very dispersed community dispersed here. Dispersed and semi-nomadic, yes. I mean, it was very harsh. The actual houses people lived in, they were just built out of rough stones on the soil. You had an earth floor, but it was very, very simple. Yes. But nevertheless, coming here to this place, even from the ruins, you can see this was quite a grand church. Yes. But it's abandoned now, and it's been abandoned for a very long time, looking at it. It has. In the 1700s, Ireland's then ruler, the British Crown, began to sell land here to English... Aids Company, which is a city of London company, took over possession and ran it rather poorly. And then a man called Richardson came in and took it over in the late 18th century and tried to make the whole place English and trebled the rents and was generally very... Form the place. And that man was Francis Turnley. He bought Cushendall from Richardson in 1809. And he had a clear vision for this picturesque village. 
Dr. Carl Hughes has studied this wealthy Irishman. Carl, what was Turnley's early life like? He came from a prosperous family in Belfast. He was the fourth son in the family, so not necessarily likely to inherit the family businesses. So he was sent to Glasgow University. He then took up a position with the East India Company, headed for China. He was responsible for overseeing the shipment of goods back to Europe from China, goods like spices and gold and textiles, becoming fabulously wealthy in the process. He returns to Ireland around 1801 um, with considerable wealth, you know, 60,000, 70,000 pounds perhaps. That's of, a vast sum of money a, in those A vast days. amount of money, it would equate to something like six or seven million pounds now. Right. So he purchases an estate in Cushendall for quite a lot of money, 24,000 pounds. But why Cushendall? Why does he come here? Well, he comes to the Glens of Antrim essentially on a trip, uh, a holiday, and falls in love with the place. Uh, the natural beauty of the Glens of Antrim really captivates him. And he was an intensely religious man and a spiritual man, and he saw in the natural beauty, you know, evidence of God's work, you know, the, the lovely bays, the lovely glens, the lovely hillsides, he saw as the glory of the creator he once wrote. Turnley could see that life in Cushendall was tough for his villagers. The previous landowners had shown them little regard. He wanted this to change. So Turnley's got this village, but what does he do to change it? Yeah, so he sees Cushendall as a proxy for these wider ideas. He's been working on this scheme for many years, which he calls the Integral Union of Human Society, something like a precursor to our modern-day United Nations, even. He talks about the combination, the, the, the central government of the world and so on. And he sees Cushendall in some ways as a, as a means to test out these ideas. So he sees, you know, that the small local philanthropic efforts that he can make, building widows' cottages, building a new pier for the area, that can be expanded out nationally, first of all, of course, but globally. This idea of charity, the idea of philanthropy, the idea of small local works combining to a greater whole, if you like. This is a period of time where there are radical ideas. So how did the people here view him? Many of his views were, were, would have been viewed as quite eccentric. We hear stories of him standing in the middle of a field and laughing heartily to himself. Uh, and whenever people were asking him why he was doing this, he would say, you know, he saw it as a, as, as a, as a form of therapy because he felt much better. He was also a great exponent of dancing for, for pleasure. He thought dancing was something that could relieve uh, mental health and depression issues as well. Uh, and also he would wear a, a red handkerchief tied around the bottom of his legs. And, and, and whenever he was asked why this was the case, and he said, well, the Glens of Antrim's a very windy place, you know. <laughs> the wind blows up your trouser leg, you know. So that, this was a means of, 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 of combating the weather around here, you know. This forward-thinking, eccentric man even decided to change the course of Cushendall's river to make his village more appealing. But it was his philanthropic measures that would begin to endear him to his tenants. Turnley wanted to bring prosperity to the village. He bought a large corn mill with two corn dryers in it and he effectively gave it to the villagers. Now, only a landowner with sufficient confidence and wealth could afford to do something like that. To ease the poverty he saw in the community, he also reduced the rents for his tenants. But there's one particular building that really captures Turnley's future hopes for his village. I've got a report here from the Reverend Richard Dobbs, who's writing in 1819, and he says, On leaving Cushendall on the old direct road and proceeding up the hill, the traveller meets with a small fort on which Mr Turnley proposes to build a schoolhouse. It will be in a very conspicuous situation. Turnley built a schoolhouse to hold about 80 girls and boys, and he took an active role in its supervision. He believed nothing was more powerful than the written or spoken word. Giesler Horscroft has lived here for 28 years. It's a wonderful location here. It's absolutely beautiful. What's it like living here? Wonderful. Yeah, we do love living here. My kids all grew up here. Great, lovely. I did notice we're on a very, very steep hill. Yeah. With these spectacular views. We've got views yeah. over the mountains, over the sea, over the village. 
and in what appears to be a circular enclosure. Mm -hmm. So it's known as a rath. Oh, well, the raths, these are pre-Norman fortifications, mm -hmm. so a chief or someone would have lived up here. Yes. Yeah. You can still see some bits of the ancient medieval maybe stonework around the side of it. I am led to believe it's very rare. In fact, it's probably the only one of its kind in Ireland, a domestic dwelling on uh, ancient sites such as a rath. I can't help feeling there's some really heavy symbolism going on here. He, he could have chosen more convenient sites to build a schoolroom, but it's here on this medieval fortification. It seems very, very designed, very deliberate. I definitely think that was intentional. So this was the schoolroom part of it, this side yeah. of it, and then the dwelling for the schoolmaster or whatever was on the other side. It would have been the living uh, accommodation. Okay. The house has been really altered over time. Uh, it's very difficult now to read as a schoolroom because you'd expect one large room, you know, and a porch maybe, but you'd expect large windows letting in a bit of light. Mm -hmm. I can just see there's a slight scar there of a, of a higher window there, mm -hmm. but it's blocked. It's very, very difficult to make out. We lowered the windows on this side. They would have been higher, but when we found when we were sitting in the living room, we couldn't actually look out into the lovely view. We had to stand up to get it. Yeah, of course, because you wouldn't want low windows. You wouldn't want the kids peering out the windows at these spectacular views, <laughs> yeah. would you? You want them concentrating on the schoolwork. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Uh -huh. Turnley also wanted to improve access to his village. In 1817, he blasted through the headland and formed what is now known as the Red Arch. This created an easier way to travel around the coast. He hoped this would encourage more trade and visitors to come to Cushendor, and to cater for them, he completed a village hotel in 1820. Local businessman Andrew McAllister's family has owned shops in Cushendor for eight generations. Turnley was one of the good guys, uh, and he just opened up the whole area. And to be honest, Cushendall expanded because of him. He's the man who, I suppose, put Cushendall literally on the map. Once the Coast Road was built, Cushendall became the service centre and a market centre, and that really made an impact. It brought more people in as well. So this becomes a, a central place, a place where people gather. It's drawing people from far and wide. Yeah, people came here for commerce. There were markets, there were fairs. The market would have gone completely up the street behind me here, up to the fair hill, and spilled right down to the streets there. They would have sold horses, sheep, cattle. Pork was a big commodity. So you can imagine it was a lively spot. There were people coming and going, pubs were doing queer business. So it was a big day for everybody. I suppose it's been known as either the capital of the Glens or the heart of the Glens. We have a very famous festival now called the Heart of the Glens. So always been somewhere that people have come for amusement and we still have some very good hostelries and uh, places of entertainment. Still plenty of amusement to yes, have here yes, then. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> There's further evidence in the village that points to the development of Cushendall in Turnley's time. Ah, this looks like an old coaching inn. See that nice wide arch there? That's to take carriages and horses. They'll be stabling at the back. And there's three or four of these buildings on these streets. And that implies to me it's a place that was designed to receive visitors, to receive travellers. There's a great little insight into the growth of the village here. It's by Irish chronicler James Boyle, and he's writing in 1835. And he says, it's within the last 100 years that Cushendall became entitled to the denomination of a town or village. It's about that time that it consisted of about six or eight of the most wretched description of cabins which stood in the vicinity of a mill. But now, in 1835, it consists of two streets intersecting each other at the centre of the town and contains 113 houses. Cushendall is a little town of great charm, its centre having much coherence and character. With a growing population and eight annual fairs bringing different clans to the village, there was inevitable drinking and fighting. Turnley could not abide unruly behaviour from his tenants. 
the biggest built statement that Turnley made in the village, the biggest symbol is this, Turnley's tower, a watchtower. And it's built of this sandstone rubble, four storeys high, and it's right in the centre of the village. That's quite deliberate. It oversees everything. It sort of glowers over the centre of the village in a way. And there you can see Turnley's initials proudly carved into a little fountain facing the street. Turnley built the Curfew Tower around 1820 for what he termed as a place of confinement for idlers and rioters. Zippy Kearney is the current caretaker. His family have lived in Cushendall for four generations. I've ended up in what feels like a prison through those thick doors into this tiny little cell. This is the dungeon part of the, of the curfew tower where Fans Attorney had it built to kind of keep his unruly people in here. So he would ring the bell at a certain time and then after that everybody had to go indoors. And if any of Fans Attorney's henchmen found you outside, this is where you were placed. And then you were kept here until your family paid a tax to get you out. I mean, it must have acted as a bit of a deterrent. I don't want to end up in the cell. I would imagine that's exactly what the, the purpose and design of it was. It's like, not to scare people not to go out. So it's like, right, if I find you out, this is where you're going. And, you know, so it worked. I would imagine it worked. So he's clearly interested in law and order, keeping these villagers in check. Yeah, well, so apparently now, France Attorney had planned to build 12 curfew towers all along the North Coast, because he was very rich, but also very uh, eccentric. But I think this one curfew tower cost him that much money, he decided not to build any more, so there you go. There were living quarters above the jail. Turnley kept the tower permanently manned by a former soldier called Dan McBride. Oh, this is a bit more homely. Got some windows, got a fireplace. Yeah, so this is where Dan McBride would have spent a lot of his time with his family, you know, doing his duties up here. Like, he had enough provisions to stay in here for a year. Now, that included food, uh, ammunition, uh, and clothes, enough to keep him in here for a year. Dan McBride would ring the curfew bell at the appointed hour as a signal for the villagers to stay indoors, and Turnley insisted his guard did not leave his post day or night. His main duty was to make sure people wouldn't come in because obviously other people's families locked in downstairs. There was going to be a lot of people at the front door going, here, excuse me, can I have my friends out? Like, you know, so... Uh... <laughs> I bet it wasn't quite as polite as, no, excuse well... me, can I have my friends out? <laughs> it feels like those Wild West movies in a way that you've got your relatives locked up in the county jail or whatever and the rest of the gang are going to come bust them out. Yeah. One of the main defences of the building would have been over here, uh, which we would call the murder hole. Murder hole? Murder hole. As you can see, the front door is actually just right there, so Dan would have been able to see who was at the front door. He would politely tell him to leave and <laughs> go back indoors. Yes, I'll bet. And if that didn't work, he would have had to use some sort of uh, other alternative to scare people off, and that would have been in the shape of this. Oh, yes. If people wouldn't leave, he would reach down and goes, please go back home again. <laughs> and they would go, no, OK. And then he'd just start firing down like that. Oh, there. my goodness, me. Yes. I've heard stories that he would have used his bodily fluids to throw down there, anything just to disperse the people away. There's one final reveal of this interesting building, and it's the best yet. Whoa. This is absolutely stunning. Oh. What a view. Sea views. Yeah. See the mountains beyond. This is incredibly impressive, yeah. it's fantastic. But more importantly, Turnley's man could see everything that yeah. was going on. You can see the whole of the village, look right to the end of the village down that street, right there. No one could move without Turnley's man knowing about it. I, th I think that's why the, the building, because it's, it's about 40 foot high, would give him a, a unique viewpoint on the whole town. It was a, probably a good advantage for him. And here's these bell right here, the curfew yes. bell. Yes, and the bell still, still works to this day, so it does. Do you still ring it if anyone's causing trouble? <laughs> I probably should start doing that, actually. <laughs> In 
1845, Cushendall had a booming population and was... Despite still having ambitious plans for his village, this was the year that Turnley died. Wow. So we've got some sort of vault chamber down here, quite a few gravestones and memorials, and there it is. That's the one that I'm looking for, in memory of Dorothea Amelia Turnley. So that's his wife, and also of Francis Turnley her husband, who died at Richmond Lodge, Belfast, in his 80th year. So wait a minute, is Francis actually here? It doesn't seem so. It sounds like it's a memorial to Francis, but because he died in Belfast, he's not actually here. His presence is here, but his mortal remains aren't. At his death, Turnley left precise details on how to complete his vision for Cushendall. Turnley's will came as a bit of a surprise to the family. He kept it a closely guarded secret, and when it was read out, they realised that although he'd provided for them, he'd also spent an awful lot on the village. And, for example, £250 he'd left for a schoolhouse, the erection of a small fever hospital, another £100, £100 for a pier, £450 for the building of six widows' houses. This is a lot of money. And it's no wonder that the family sought to contest this will on the grounds that Turnley was a little bit odd, a bit mad. In 1848, Turnley's will went before the court. On trial were his visionary ideas and his own eccentric character. In coming to his judgment, the judge said that Francis Turnley's belief that he'd been brought into the world in order to accomplish the integral union of human society is a morbid impression or delusion. And if his will is the result of such a delusion, it is not his will. So he cannot be considered to have a sound and disposing mind so as to be capable of making his last will and testament. So that was it. The will was set aside, the Cushendall Trust was dissolved, the village, those good causes got none of the money, and the family remained in possession of all of the property. Although Cushendall had lost its patron, Turnley had laid the foundations for this community to flourish. 
The village today is a lively, busy place, well known to tourists coming to the area or people just passing through on that coast road. But it's gratifying to know that it's still pulling people in from the glens, it's still acting as a market centre and that there are generations of families here who are rooted in the village. I think something of Turnley's spirit lives on here.